Hi, my name is Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So thank you this Sunday, 18th of February 2024, uh, where we will talk about Ultra Stepwise. How is everyone? Can they hear me? Corky Ga Goss is in the house. We have Mr. Gate Mode, Anne Witkowski, Ken Pratt, Nathan Ford. Thank you, Nathan. Lithnik, thank you. Matthew Reynolds, Tony Yaboni, Artifact, thank you for the recent email, Artifact, thank you, Vanilla Isis, that's a great name, isn't it, Bo Sinclair, Daz Pazaz, oh, Lucas, D2105K, Creating Awareness, a great to have you with us this evening. Or day. Or morning, depending on where you are in this beautiful blue globe of ours. Excellent. Thank you for letting me know. Bo Sinclair. Hi, Friar Tuck. Hi, Martin Kemp. And hi, Luke. Wonderful. Okay, I like this uh, piece of uh, bronze or brass uh, that I found in the British Museum. One of many treasures uh, in their Discovering Babylonia section or thereabouts. I'll walk through some of them at a different time. But I particularly like these kind of like circular structures here with the inside intertwined meshed structures. And then in the center you have these floret with a center spot. And this kind of vortical structure here, this reminds me of the area where the a action goes into kind of like a wormhole and this vortical section and then this area where it's only inside this zone and this zone where you really get the major action in these structures. So this is actually going to be quite a quick one and it's to bring together two bits of data. And the first one was part of the Russian review of the Bin Zhuen Huang et al. paper. And two speakers were asked to comment on it. I, as you will see, I still haven't done a very good translation of the Russian. Um, I have two versions on the go, as it were, uh, both auto-generated in the video that we'll see in a moment. But it was... Dr. Alexander Parkamov, and the second speaker who I will be referring to in this presentation was one Alexander Shishkin. And so here he is, Alexander Shishkin, up here on the right. And he has this, what he calls a hydrodynamic machine, HDM, and this is for water cavitation. And we've looked at this machine a number of times before. This was the machine that in the late 2000s he was using to create an oil or water emulsion. This was requested of him uh, by a customer and it was near this cavitation section where he felt rather sick when it was under operation. And so he put these x-rays around it, x-ray film rather, and he found these birdies. And you can go and look at the presentation, a new type of penetrating <laughs> radiation, new type of penetrating <laughs> radiation on our uh, MFMP YouTube channel. And you would see these birdies on there and he looked under the birdies and saw these pits and was able to define that something was coming out of this cavitator through the metal and through the air through the uh, sleeve in which the x-ray film was held and was exposing the x-rays and when it broke up in his view because it got excited by the material that the x-ray was made from it would dishevel 
produced these birdies and under them were these pits and the pits because they put it through different gases and materials they could define the width and the depth of the pits with a constant a different constant for each depending on the atoms nucleus that had been captured by these structures and transported <clears throat> now what i didn't know and he reveals in this presentation is that uh, there was some recirculation going on so this is similar to uh, the Cladoff tests where he would recirculate the material through the material uh, through the um, apparatus <clears throat> deliberately to try and get some stepwise transmutation in order to produce some radioactive emissions that he could then detect so Alexander Shishkin actually revealed some more detail about these experiments and we shall look at that right now so he's describing the fact that this is his cavitator and we'll go on and he says it works like a circulation pump and it has a storage capacity of 37 liters of water the overall thing in the storage tank and he ran a treatment time of that 37 liters uh, for 11 minutes and 45 seconds now the motor that you see here is 8.5 kilowatts okay 8.5 kilowatts and during this 11 minutes and 45 seconds, there was an increase in the water temperature of 60 degrees C. Now, this particular cavitation pump was essentially two discs. One is a stator, one is a, you know, rotating. And it was actually a whole series of grooves like that that were cut into either side. Uh, of the the device uh, one not moving the other one moving and so you've got extreme hydrodynamic shear extreme hydrodynamic shear now remember what I've been saying there's two things that I believe are absolute critical for creating this effect one is charge separation and the other one is extreme hydrodynamic shear okay and so when we look at this, um, you can see that, well, if you're putting 8.5 kilowatts of energy in to the motor, it's not unsurprising that within a period of time, you're going to get a rise in the temperature of the water. But it is 37 liters, 37 liters. I haven't done the maths. Maybe someone could choose to do that. But given the fact that this is not rising it to boiling temperature or raising it to boiling temperature it's raising it by 60 degrees centigrade if we raise 37 liters by 60 degrees centigrade maybe someone can do the maths and come back in the chat uh, how much watts would that take and would uh, 11.45 11 minutes 45 seconds of 8.5 kilowatts allow us to achieve a 60 degree rise in 37 liters of water that's uh, some homework for you but that's not the interesting thing from my perspective for the purposes of this discussion what he found was uh, during this period of 11 minutes and 45 seconds they actually went away and analyzed the water and they found that, and bearing in mind this is a accuracy not worse than one part per million, in this 705 second experiment in 2018, that across the 37 litres of water, the deuterium had risen in proportion in the water from 143.1 parts per million 
to 143.7 parts per million. So that is 0.6 parts per million. Now, one could argue that this is well within the margin of error, but it is showing a direction, isn't it? And then secondly, he looked at oxygen 18 parts per million, and in this case, it went from 1973, 1973.7 parts per million to 1975.7 parts per million. Now, he's not going to comment. He actually says here, I'm not going to comment too much about what this means. This is uh, processing accuracy of measurement is no worse than one parts per million. And that means that the deuterium increased in 12 minutes uh, and oxygen, uh, and he says, I won't comment on how this turns out. It's just experimental um, fact. Okay, so he's just saying that this is just an experimental fact. And uh, there we go. Now, one might argue that deuterium is being formed potentially in this instance from an antineutrino, an electron, and a proton fusing together to make a neutron at the same time as fusing with a existing proton. I would argue at this phase singularity caused by the fractal toroidal moment of the complex magnetohydrodynamic structure, which is the wheel within the wheel within the wheel. This is not so conclusive, but this is at least outside of the bounds of error. Now, someone would come in and say, well, you know, if you've got heat and maybe something is boiling off, I don't know. Um, but this is outside of the margin of error. Now, if we go back, uh, where is it? He says, what is he saying here? Uh, he gives credit to these two characters, one of which we talked about recently, Anatoly uh, Fedorovich Kladov, who was born in 1939 and lived till 2003, and he literally worked on cavitation right up to the end of his life. And Afanasyev, so this is uh, Vladimir Stepanovich Afanasyev from 1938 to 2015. These greats of cavitation research. Okay, so is there anything else I want to say about that before we just do the mass um, okay so if I'm going to my Parkamov reaction calculator let me bring up a, a new window here and I'm going to zoom in a bit Okay. Right. So what I want to do here is I want to go to fusion reactions here. And I go down to the query here. And let's say most of our water is hydrogen. And we're looking for a, a reaction that's going to take us through to... Um, Deuterium, let's say. So, most of our water contains hydrogens, as in proteums rather than deuterium. And we'll run this, and we'll execute the query. And there we go. There is one result, and it requires a neutrino on the left, in this case an antineutrino, and the... An, atomic hydrogen and you fuse that with an atomic hydrogen and you get a deuteron and 1.441955 mega electron volts. Now is there anything we can get for instance from 2 to 2 reactions where we have um, let's say oxygen in here and oxygen. Okay. And let's see if we have any 2 to 2 reactions that can lead to the production of deuterium. 
is there anything? Ah, now, okay, so there's lots going on here. And so let's actually, let's actually do this. And E3 in open brackets, um, D. So we're looking to see if there are any potential reactions that in, when you have a two to two reaction that the lighter of the right side synthesized elements is uh, deuteron. Okay. Right. Okay. So we can have fusion and then fission of oxygen isotopes leading to the production of deuterons and the production of sulfur, phosphorus and silicon. Even in the case of oxygen 16 here, but we require a neutrino on the left. We want to see what we get without any neutrinos involved. We get this reaction. One option, oxygen 16 plus oxygen 17 goes to a deuteron plus 31 phosphorus. Okay. So there is a fusion fission reaction in the simple reactions that are looking at either 2 to 1 or 2 to 2. Out of those, there is actually a, uh, a reaction that will take oxygen and produce deuterium. So this is the kind of thinking that you have to look at when you're considering potentially how these things occur. Is it actually fusion that's going on or is it fission? This is like with the deuterium palladium system. Is it really helium that's being synthesized or is it fusion fission that's leading to the production of helium as a kind of like cluster uh, decay in a, in a splitting up of the excited cluster, as it were. So it would be nice if it was producing deuterium from fusing of protons uh, and an electron and an antineutrino because that would potentially support other things that we're going to discuss and it would discuss it would it would support the um Binjou and Huang work and it would also support the work uh, of the thunderstorm generator of Malcolm Bendel okay so that is that and then let's have a look at uh reactions to produce let's say um oxygen 18 for instance which is what he observed a more clear signal on the oxygen 18 so we can put O here in fact uh, you can do like this uh, this might actually work A uh, 2 equals oh sorry I don't want that I want mm -hmm. I do want O here and then I can go and E or A. Is it A? I want A equals 18. That should limit it to oxygen 18, unless I've got something wrong, <laughs> which I may do. Okay, so there we go. So there's two options here. Both of them require a antineutrino on the left and either atomic deuteron or an atomic proteum okay so this would be deuteron with a, an electron or a proton with an electron and in this case we can fuse directly with oxygen 16 and get oxygen 18. now this is interesting because this might be the case that where you have H2O you are fusing effectively the both protons and the oxygen 16 which is the most abundant by far oxygen isotope into oxygen 18 okay so that would be effectively you have an electron left over like if you know what I mean so you take two hydrogens and you make one deuteron 
out of that. And that deuteron goes with the oxygen 16 to produce oxygen 18. So in my view, that might be the reason why um, Shishkin was looking for oxygen 18 and oxygen uh, and deuter deuterium. The pair deuterium, deuterium and oxygen 18 would suggest this kind of like process of sometimes fusing two hydrogens to deuterium and sometimes that also simultaneously or sequentially fusing with oxygen 16 to produce oxygen 18. And as we saw in his data, the uh, oxygen 18, oh, if I can do it again, the oxygen 18 was the stronger of the two signals. Okay, the oxygen 18. This is the more clear because it's outside of the error. Not massively, it's double the error. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's a signal. And then bearing in mind, this is in only in 705 seconds. This is in 11 minutes. So when you're looking at this, this is an 8.5 kilowatt device, whereas Kladoff were was using hundreds of kilowatts. He was only running this for 11 minutes and 45 seconds, whereas Kladoff was running the device for far longer. Um, what Shishkin actually says is that the reason he couldn't run it for longer than uh, 11 minutes, 45 seconds, is uh, he says somewhere here that actually it starts producing steam and therefore it can't uh, continue to work. Uh, so, so here you can say the cavitator heats up inside uh, to 60 degrees C and then boiling begins and accordingly um, there is no further water circulation. So in the case of Kladoff, uh, he was able to put it into a, an a accumulator with a much, much larger volume of water uh, and maybe take that heat away, for instance, uh, whereas... In the case of Shishkin, he wasn't able to take it away, so he was limited to runs of 11 minutes and 45 seconds. So much, much lower power, much, much lower run times than we discussed for the Kladoff work. But still, with these short run times, it is reasonable to consider that there is deuterium being synthesized, and that that is promoting the synthesis of oxygen 18. And this is, in my view, quite significant. Um, because if we also go to the reaction calculator, so firstly, you're, to get to um, oxygen 18 from oxygen 17, sorry, from oxygen 16, um, you have to go, H1 into oxygen 16 goes to oxygen 17, which is a reaction we know can occur, or it would appear to occur in Bin Chen Huang's work. And then you stepwise go H1 into O17 with the antineutrino to oxygen 18. This way is kind of like how I see these reactions occurring is, yes, they can go stepwise, but if you've got everything in that phase singularity, you can have a vast number of nucleons simultaneously fusing and fissioning. Now, statistically speaking, um, uh, if you've got a lot of protons going in there, a lot of electrons and a lot of uh, oxygen nuclei, what is the most likely outcome of those things? Could it be the production of um, oxygen 17 and oxygen 18, respectively? He didn't look for oxygen 17. He didn't look for oxygen 17, okay? So, um, if we look at the abundance here, if we go to show element data, and we look at the abundance of oxygen here, you can see here 16, 17, and 18. Oxygen 16 is 99.759% of oxygen in the Earth's crust, in all those lovely oceans that we enjoy. Oxygen-18 is the second most abundant at around about one-fifth of one percent. And oxygen-17 is vanishingly small at uh, 
3.7 one hundredths of 1%. Okay, so not a lot of oxygen-17. So if you are getting quite a significant increase in that 700 and something second experiment, one might imagine that it is either going through here, here and here rather rapidly, or it's going straight from here to here by the full fusion of a water molecule. Okay? Now, this has implications for the not only Binger and Huang's work, but also it has implications for the uh, thunderstorm generator. Because if the ball lightning, and note, when I'm talking about these systems, the cavitation work of Binger and Huang and the thunderstorm generator, we have already shown by the MFMP's own experimentation that in a simple ultra experiment, we are synthesizing these iron-rich crenellated spheres that, in my view, are a signature of ball lightning. And in the plasma experiment of uh, Henk Urien, we observed the iron-rich crenellated spheres. So we know plasma and water do this. Water cavitation and plasma experiments. In the case of Bin Jiren Huang, he's doing water cavitation. In the case of the thunderstorm generator, it is doing... Uh, effectively, they're both producing these magnetohydrodynamic structures, which are the core, which do produce the same kind of phase singularity for the fractal toroidal moment out of these complex current structures that leads, in my view, to this magnetic core, which is able to do the transmutation at the phase singularity. And one of the signatures that pops out of that, whilst it's done a lot of that, is this highly magnetic, iron-rich, crenellated microsphere, which has iron and oxygen in it. So, um, you can imagine that if we are putting water into the thunderstorm generator and that that is going into the ball lightning structures, if it's doing what one might consider is occurring uh, here in this work of Cladoff, yes, Here, yeah, if I can get that right again. Where is it? Here. If you're actually converting water into oxygen 18, if you're converting water into oxygen 18, then you are removing water from the overall system and increasing the amount of oxygen that's available to oxidize the um, material in there. Okay, And in that instance, you're going to have a cleaner burn. You're going to have much less CO produced, carbon monoxide produced, and a much more efficient burn, one might argue. So is that, what, is that what's going on? I don't know. But in a second series of beamline tests, we will be looking for uh, increased, I believe, I think it is, we're going to be looking for increased oxygen-18, and the synthesis of sulfur-34. If we have more than natural sulfur-34, so if I go and show you what the natural sulfur-34 is, if we go here and we go down to sulfur, sulfur-34 here, sulfur-32 is 95%. Sulfur-33 is 0.76%. And sulfur 34 is 4.22 percent. So, if we get a ratio back of sulfur 34 much higher than 4.22 over uh, 95, then that could indicate that could indicate that more oxygen 17 was being produced, and that that oxygen 17 was fusing. If we do the fusion reaction here, and we take oxygen and oxygen and we do and e in okay then we can see our fusion reactions here and the most energetic and therefore in my view the most likely synthesized 
sulfur is sulfur 34, but we've just shown it's a low abundance. So in the second series of beamline tests, I'm going to look for, or I'm going to ask the independent party to try and give us an understanding of the concentration of sulfur 34 over sulfur 32 and the abundance of oxygen 18 over oxygen 16. And in my view, that may be uh, give us very, very strong evidence that the thunderstorm generator is doing the same kind of thing that's going on in Bin Juen Huang's device and um, that there is both oxygen 17 and oxygen 18 uh, being synthesized. Anyway, so that's that's what we're going to look for there. And I think that's all I really want to say on this particular data from um uh alexander shishkin so now the actual cavitator that he has here um is different from the cladoff cavitator this rotary one that i described however when i was speaking to um Max Formichev Zamolov, he actually reached out to me because I spoke about the Kladov patent and had translated it. And it was because he was actually, for a year, uh, trying to work with the Kladov patent. Um, and he hadn't had much luck. And so he sold that device and then he built another one. Um, but the new one was similar to the device as I described here with these uh, keyways going in between to create extreme hydrodynamic shear. Okay. But the difference was, I said, like, what did you make the original Kladoff type cavitator from? And he did say, well, we didn't know the measurements and stuff and blah, blah, blah. He came back and said he made it of stainless steel. And I said, well, therein probably lies your problem. In fact, he, he told me that the second cavitator was made of, like, mild steel. Mild steel is magnetic. Stainless steel is not uh, magnetic. Okay? I think that's the problem. You do not have the ability to aggregate the magnetic charges um, if you don't use a, a magnetic or paramagnetic material. Note that in ultra experiments, we are typically using aluminium which is of the four most conductive elements the only one that is paramagnetic copper sorry silver most conductive copper second gold or gold silver, gold copper whether rather they're all diamagnetic aluminium paramagnetic and of course we know from the work of Mizuno with his 800 times COP in the 1990s, I think 1994 to 1996, somewhere around that period, he had a a tungsten electrode-based electrolysis experiment that kind of blew up. Uh, it was his singularity event, and they calculated that the, the energy must have been around about 800 times. So I have a, suggested to, um, and it's not just because of this, it's also because of when... Um, when, when Suhas Ralkar was trying to create the 5 micron size powder for his plasma reactor, he couldn't buy that type of size powder very easily in India. So he bought what he could. It might have been 100, it might have been 200 microns or whatever, 50 microns. And then he bought tungsten powder. And his thinking was... Uh, that the tungsten powder is so much harder than the other elements that in his four and a half kilowatt ultrasound, and he had two horns, one and a half kilowatts opposite each other, producing phase conjugation, okay, and standing waves. And then a sep separate one below with a hard reflector above producing standing waves and phase conjugation. So you had a crossing of the beams in the center. He thought that by adding tungsten, 
it would uh it would mill the titanium the nickel and the other things that he had in there down to smaller sizes and and in fact it would appear to have done that but he sent me some un uh, un uh, screened material for me to analyze which i did uh, under sem and he was utterly shocked there was zero tungsten left absolutely zero david hubson had observed in a, a tungsten thumb sized uh for, uh, electric arc furnace for trying to um do something with his ormus the entire thumb sized electrode disappeared so you have him in the 1980s twice with successive experiments david hudson you have mizuno in the 1990s then you could say let's say um the sapphire group they had an 11000 dollar Langmuir probe that came in it hit the ball lightning coherent matter uh double there and instantaneously that tungsten disappeared we have demonstrated on video and shared through our channel in the vega experiments of hank urian where he has a tungsten wire it gets cut and it gets cut on the double layer of the ball lightning that forms on that wire i believe we have conclusively shown that ball lightning's coherent matter layer can cause tungsten to disappear and so we know this is occurring in cavitation this would explain where the tungsten went in all of these various systems and so i've advised uh, for um, Max Formachev Zamilov to add tungsten powder to his device when he's got the reflector at the top and run for the hills before he turns it on, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> so, why am I saying tungsten? Well, let me show you. Also, Randall Mills had tungsten electrodes disappear in his devices. And, of course, he's using water and high-intense, uh, short-duration, high-DIDT high um, uh, impulses. Okay, so I'm going to go to P-Table here. It's a wonderful little site if you haven't used it before. And you can see here, if I go down to conductivity and we switch this to electrical here yeah, yeah and uh, i click on tunk conductivity you can see here that silver the most conductive then copper then gold but all of these are diamagnetic the third most conductive after gold is aluminium now bearing in mind these exotic vacuum objects these ball lightning they love electrons they eat on electrons they they feed on those electrons so on the piece of surface of a metal you have these free electrons ready and willing to travel so when these things that like electrons come in contact with aluminium they start consuming the electrons and because uh aluminium is paramagnetic and these structures have this magnetic moment to them they will start to consume the aluminium and this is kind of what's going on in my view in the ultra experiment to a degree and because aluminium itself is a spin nuclei and it's as i say paramagnetic and it's a single isotope it has everything it needs as food to go into this structure okay so this is why i believe it's one of the most affected materials in uh, John Hutchison's work and why it was as added uh, additive to Kladoff's work this alumino silicate this uh, uh, 
material he added at 5%, it would have provided a very nice food for the cavitation structures and their magnetohydrodynamic nature. Okay, in a way that copper, silver, and gold wouldn't. Now, in the case of the findings of Tesla using silver activated uh, uh, zinc sulfide as a means by which to capture and image using his eth etheric matter streams. It's not surprising because silver is the most conductive element. And this is the basis of Shishkin's uh, strange radiation shield material. He adds silver with strontium aluminate, or sil which is a phosphor, silver with zinc sulfide. Zinc sulfide is a so phosphor. And then he adds that uh, with a latex and water base and paints that on. And so my understanding is the silver, when the strange radiation comes in, when the strange radiation comes into the X-ray film, which is silver bromide or whatever, um, it then gets excited by the silver particles in the shielding material, and it then converts these dark mode exotic vacuum objects, these dark mode magnetohydrodynamic structures, or what Shishkin and uh, Karols and Dubovic call magnetotoroelectrical radiation, when it comes in, it gets excited into a magnetotor electrical cluster because now it's got these electrons getting involved. And then it destabilizes it, it blows up, and then the energy is dissipated into the phosphor. Okay. Now, tungsten, you'll see here, is 20. Now, there are elements that have higher conductivity, like beryllium, magnesium, sodium, uh, calcium. Okay, these are, but these things, brilliant, super toxic, and, and these things kind of like all self ignite in water or ignite in air. You kind of don't want to work with these. Note that the preferred elements for Tesla were beryllium, magnesium, and aluminium. All highly conductive elements beryllium, magnesium, and aluminium. Okay, low mass number, highly conductive elements. Okay, however, these ones are quite close. So this is 23, this is 20, 25. Molybdenum and tungsten are quite special. And, and both uh, Mills found that tungsten and molybdenum both disappeared. And he thought, because in his universe, it's a different thing that's going on. But in his universe, um, uh, this is caused by excess heat. I think probably there might be some excess heat but it's actually a, a, an emergent effect out of the fact that the structures are consuming the electrons and these this matter, this particular matter here, is ready to hand over those electrons. And additionally, like aluminium, tungsten and molybdenum are paramagnetic. Unlike these elements, tungsten and molybdenum are paramagnetic. And because tungsten is so massive there's a lot of energy to be gained by fissioning tungsten tungsten so in my view and i've said this to the sapphire group and so on um tungsten is a beautiful fuel for this process okay tungsten is a beautiful fuel it's almost unique in the fact that it has a really high conductivity it's paramagnetic out of these three elements here that are paramagnetic. Um, but it has this huge energy that can be gained by the fissioning process. Of course, this makes it a little bit more poof and it's gone type thing rather than aluminium where it's kind of fusing together to gain the energy. Okay, so I'm interested to see what is found by... Um, by... Max Formichev Zamilov, should he uh, put in tungsten powder into his device? I suspect it might be quite interesting. It might be quite interesting. Anyway, so what, um, and what was my point about going on about that? <laughs> yeah, so essentially, 
aluminium was a fuel in the Cladoff work and aluminium is essentially a fuel in the ultra experiments where you have aluminium foil and another famous experimenter who did cavitation and produced a lot of elements was Leclerc and Leclerc had aluminium sheet with uh, circular holes cut into it and then rolled and so you can see that uh, okay so th there's a pattern emerging here if we have a paramagnetic material we are going to see some more interesting things going on and so what Max Formachev Zamolov didn't know I think uh, was that he was uh, using a non-magnetic material and that could have been why he had no success in his original attempts at doing Cladoff replication. Uh, he then sold that and then uh, made a device out of mild steel which was very similar to this kind of device, not like Cladoff's device um, but like this device where you have these uh, slots, keyways producing extreme hydro hydrodynamic shear and that was made out of uh, mild steel soft iron um, that would be magnetic okay you could make it out of aluminium because then the aluminium won't rust um, and it would produce the the paramagnetic nature we know it works in the um, the ultra experiments but you might find that it's so so much power uh, because the iron is not going to want to fuse much it's going to allow the aggregation of the monopoles so when you go and look at the work of Solin Mikhail Solin in his patent from 1992 he says the free electron laser going into uh, the uh, molybdenum let's say or the tungsten yeah it's those ones again going into the molybdenum or whatever, the low vapor pressure metal, it causes the productions of solitons of two magnetic charges and that then these solitons aggregate and then they form spheres and tubes inside which nuclear reactions occur. Now, if you have your reactor not made of a magnetic material then or paramagnetic material then you haven't got focal points for these magnetic monopoles to aggregate and so you won't get this process occurring in the same way so I think it's very important for people considering replication to choose I would suggest mild steel now there's issues with rusting and this that and the other okay fine but we, we want to try the effect I think if you use aluminium, you're, you're possibly going to, one, have extreme effects occurring uh, and two, run the risk of uh, um, large fluxes of radiation because uh, we, we know it seems to progress very quickly with aluminium. So please proceed with caution. There is a large potential for things flying out of this uh, particularly if you do what Cladoff did and add lithium chloride. I haven't added that to the blog yet. I will do that at some point early next week. I did talk about uh, the addition or rather the synthesis of silicon 31 uh, from carbon and oxygen in that blog. But I, I will talk about why lithium uh, chloride is working potentially to produce neutrons. And also I've asked uh, for... Max Formachev Zamolov to do that to add in the lithium chloride because he's probably once he's got the the reflector so he gets the proper standing waves he's probably got the best equipment already built and ready to go to verify whether the lithium chloride will under ultrasonic conditions lead to the production of neutrons I'm reasonably confident it's because the lifetime of a neutron being synthesized and going into lithium-7 which is most of lithium is around about 0.9 of a second 
There's plenty of time in 0.9 of a second for another one to be synthesized and go into that lithium uh, 8. And then that produces lithium 9, which survives for about quarter of a second. Again, plenty of time in a cavitation system at ultrasonic uh, frequencies to then go from uh, lithium 8, uh, sorry, lithium 9 to lithium 10. Lithium 10 instantaneously, essentially, decays 100% of the time with a neutron. Instantaneously, 100% of the time with a neutron, back to lithium 9. And so you can have a, a scenario where lithium 9 goes to lithium 10, emits a neutron, goes back to lithium 9, lithium 9 gets another neutron, goes back to lithium 10, emits a neutron, and so it goes through a cycle. So I will detail that with the references on the blog for the Cladoff um, uh, video. Okay, so if he does those things, he will verify what Cladoff did with his current uh, uh, system, and he will also be able to demonstrate that tungsten additive powder to a cavitation system can massively increase excess heat. Of course, I would like to see the um, aluminosilicate uh, material being added as well into various systems. I think 11, a COP of 11 plus is absolutely fantastic. That's a really great yield uh, from the cavitation system. Okay, so essentially what we've done here is we have shown that there is evidence already in the record uh, that has emerged because of the data sharing in the paper by Binjuren Huang et al. that supports potentially the fusion of two hydrogens into uh, deuterium and the fusion of two hydrogens and oxygen, uh, in both cases there's, a, there's an electron and an antineutrino involved, uh, through to oxygen 18. And that this has implications supporting both the work of Bin Zhen Huang and the thunderstorm generator of Malcolm Bendel. Right, now I'm going to look at this second paper, or second piece of work, which is actually by Max Formichev Zamolov, and you will be able to download this yourself. Um, and let me just get this up for you. I will put this in the reference to the blog, or references of the blog, when... Um, the presentation is over or reasonably soon afterwards so I just need to find it <laughs> where is it <laughs> uh -huh. okay No, I don't want that. Okay, so... Um, let's, let's have a look at this right now. So... This is absolutely totally in line with what we are doing on the beam line. So I am suggesting that potentially in the thunderstorm generator, in my view, caused by a complex current structure, which is a uh, something that is magneto um, magnetohydrodynamic and produces the toroidal moment, that hydrogens are uh, going into carbon, for instance, and producing nitrogen, and hydrogens are being fused with electrons and antineutrinos into neutrons and going in to produce higher isotopes of nitrogen and higher isotopes of oxygen. And also that protons are sequentially going into uh, carbon to produce nitrogen and oxygen. And so there is an increase in the amount of nitrogen being produced. And because they're not looking for nitrogen in the... Um, in the uh, uh, analysis coming out of the exhaust, they do look for nitrous oxides, but they're not looking for nitrogen. 
okay? Which is 78% of air anyway. So if you are increasing the amount of nitrogen synthesized by capturing and sequestering some of that carbon into nitrogen and or oxygen, then it's not surprising that you have a reduction in carbon dioxide coming out, okay? Um, and if this is happening in the exhaust, so like the, the carbon dioxide's coming out, but then that's somehow fusing and, and it's being made into to nitrogen or oxygen, then the engine does its thing and the engine is part producing the, the necessity or the, the necessary environment to enable the transmutation potentially in the uh, exhaust part of the process in something that looks like an invisible uh, Tesla globe with the outside of the inside having the ring spots uh, where the electrons are pinching together and the inside of the outside where the material is then coming out of the wormhole type structure and producing iron and, and other elements like nitrogen and so forth. Okay, so I wasn't aware of this work, uh, but he sent it to me because he was saying, we did this Cladoff thing. Of course, I've talk talked about the stainless steel uh, potential error in there and why it might not have worked. And then after a year, they moved on to this other device and they were mixing uh, oil and water, doing cavitation. And he just sent me this paper, and it was just it was just a beautiful piece of circumstance because this paper actually supports uh, what might be going on in the uh, thunderstorm generator. In the thunderstorm generator, the magnetohydrodynamic structures are produced in the plasma. In the cavitation system, they're produced in the fluid, but it's still a magnetohydrodynamic system. Okay, so apparent synthesis of nitrogen and oxygen from heavy hydrocarbons, the case for Lena. So the idea here was to try and crack some uh, heavy um, hydrocarbons and, and effect effectively upgrade uh, those heavy hi uh, hydrocarbons. The intent of this communication is to encourage discussion that will help reveal the truth, whatever it might be. Thank you, Max Formachev Zamolov. Okay, extreme hydrodynamic cavitation and shearing of 5.6 kilograms of heavy hydrocarbon oil, Kendex 0842, in a QVI hammer technology. Right, this is, apparently the, this is, anyway, it's 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 a, it's a technology, okay? Uh, by this, uh, uh, it's a trademark, so you can go and look that up. Reactor results in apparent synthesis of 22 grams of oxygen, 0.4% by mass, and 5 grams of nitrogen. 0.1% of mass. Boom! Right there in the first sentence of this paper. The nitrogen is primarily outgassing in the form of micro bubbles, producing 3.6 litres of gas, while oxygen is primarily oxidising the oil and forming resins. Again, the nitrogen is primarily outgassing in the form of micro bubbles, producing 3.6 litres of gas while oxygen is primarily oxidizing the oil forming resins. Atmospheric contamination is completely ruled out by degassing the oil within the reactor by heating it to 80 degrees C for five hours under 50 micro uh, uh, mercury vacuum um, and situating the reactor in an argon-filled enclosure. The unusual features of the process include rapid outgassing during the processing with prep pressure rapidly rising to 1,000 PSIG and higher when the oil is heated only to 150 degrees C. And the initial boiling point of this oil is 448 degrees C. This is exactly the kind of thing that is being reported by Bin Zhuen Huang. Independently, in water cavitation, this is cavitation of oil oil water cavitation oil the water is producing a non-condensable gas in his case neon which bin Zhuen huang confirmed with a flame test okay and co2 okay when we turn off the reactor the pressure quickly returns to zero psig as if the gas is instantaneously reabsorbed the pressure within the reactor remains at zero PSIG until the oil cools down to about 80 degrees C, at which point profuse 
90% nitrogen and 10% oxygen outgassing begins and continues for days. Given that we have eliminated all sources of contamination that we th can think of, the production of nitrogen and oxygen can only be explained by low energy nuclear reactions, possibly along the lines of carbon plus two hydrogen equals nitrogen. Now, that isn't quite what's going on because you would have to have one of these hydrogens uh, producing, because if, if you add two, two protons to carbon, you end up with oxygen, okay? So this must be one atomic hydrogen producing a neutron, one proton, and those combining into carbon to make nitrogen. And in this case, it's the same thing. One of these atomic hydrogens produces a neutron with an antineutrino, and one of the protons then fuses with nitrogen to make oxygen. Boom! This is exactly the same thing. Strangely, no radiation. Look at that. Strangely, no radiation. No radiation. Now, when we go and look at how he thinks this is occurring, it's the same kind of reaction that a reviewer from Nature Scientific Reports requested we add in as an alternative for our proposed reaction. And you will see that it is producing a neutron first and the neutron going into the atom. Now, when you do that, you have an energy barrier to overcome. So where is that energy coming from? Two... When a neutron goes into a nucleus, it excites it and you get a gamma ray out. Strangely, no radiation. So it can't be that, but anyway, he suggests it. And we'll, we'll look at that when we come to it. Neutron or gamma. So they do not see a neutron or they do not see a gamma. Now, if you were synthesizing neutrons first and not all of the neutrons got used, you would expect to see some neutrons. So you're not seeing neutrons and you're not seeing gamma. We'll look at that in a little while. Neutron or gamma is produced and no significant excess heat is observed. Okay. Now I need to go and look at Parkamov's, and I'll do this in a different presentation. But Parkamov, as I, I've told you, he, he thinks now that an antineutrino and neutrino are formed during the impacts that occur, let's say, in cavitation. And that in our case, we're using an antineutrino to produce a neutron uh, from a proton and an electron. And you then have this uh, uh, low energy uh, neutrino left over and that that can carry away a large proportion of the energy. So you do not see the energy you would expect to produce uh, because a pro proportion of that energy is taken away by that um, other uh, neutrino. While the lack of radiation is consistent with the majority of observed Lenner phenomena, the absence of excess heat is puzzling. And I've just attempted to explain that, and I will, in a separate presentation, probably next week, uh, uh, go into Parkamov's uh, refined understanding. If this was a nuclear process, where did the energy go? Or, if the process was non-nuclear in nature, then where did the nitrogen and oxygen come from? Okay. Introduction. For the past two years, our company has been working on designing crude oil upgrading equipment that relies on cavitation and extreme shear to break molecular bonds. Extreme shear to break molecular bonds. That is what is going on in the global environmental uh, uh, energy technology called the GEET. That's the whole basis, basis of it. As it's spinning around that rod, yeah, it's breaking up those bonds. And this is also the basis for, in part, the thunderstorm generator. And uh, crack long-chain hydrocarbons into lighter components. Our patent-pending reactor is a rotate, rotor stator apparatus that has features of both shear mixer and water hammer system. By processing heavy oil through our reactor, we are able to reduce visco vis bleh, viscosity 49 to 85% and increase the API gravity by 1 to 2 degrees. To test our reactor on small volumes of oil, about 1 gallon, we have built an experimental setup comprising the reactor loop and control and cooling loop, figure 1. The schematic diagram of the experimental setup is shown in figure 2. So, they have a chunky motor here, okay? 
This is the cavitator. You can see it looks a bit, little bit similar, but in different orientation to the one of Alexander Shishkin. I guess this is the cooling loop. You've got a heat exchanger here. It's like a miniature version of what you see with Bin Zhen Huang. Okay, and you've probably got some pumps to uh, push the oil around. Okay. You can have a look at this in your own time. There is the schematic. Okay. The Reactor 1 features a 12-inch rotor that spins at 3,000 to 3,600 RPM. I think Shishkin's rotor span at about 5,000 RPM, but then it was only working with water, so it's a high, much less viscous. Yes? And is powered by a 100 horsepower three-phase AC electric motor controlled via variable frequency drive not shown. The, free, the reactor is fitted with an analog pressure gauge and a K-type thermocouple which, is mounted, uh, which are mounted directly onto the reactor stator and thus make direct contact with the spinning oil. The reactor is fed from the steel tanklet mounted at the reactor discharge port on top of the reactor. To enter the reactor, the oil flows through the programmable pressure relief valve and then via the reactor feed line and into the reactor inlet in the center uh, of the reactor's circular front plate. The tanklet and the reactor loop are filled from the top via the fill valve which remains closed during the operation. The main function of the pressure relief valve is to be to bleed the excess pressure that may develop in the reactor loop into the cooling loop uh, via the cooling loop feed line. The cooling loop is comprised of two water-cooled heat exchangers, positive displacement feed pump, analog pressure gauge and a K-type thermocouple. The cooling loop is fed from the reactor loop via the cooling valve and the cooled oil is returned to the reactor via the return valve 13. The cooling and return valves are closed during the normal reactor operation while oil cycles within the reactor loop. We open these valves only when the processing is complete and the oil needs to be cooled by cycling through the water cooled heat exchangers in uh, the cooling loop. For sample collection, the cooling loop is connected to a Yogacawa density meter and the sample valve 15. Under normal conditions, we operate the system as follows. First, we deposit lukewarm 70 degrees C oil into the reactor by pouring it through uh, the fill valve 7. Then we circulate the oil through the reactor loop for about 1 to 2 minutes via pumping and uh, pumping action of the reactor. When the reactor is operating, it develops 140 psi of head pressure due to the centrifugal action of the spinning rotor. The head pressure is reflected on the pressure gauge mounted in the reactor stator. We end the processing cycle when the oil temperature reaches 150 to 200 degrees C. When the processing is successful, we observe 20 to 70 psi of the residual pressure in the reactor loop due to the formation of light hydrocarbons by way of hydrodynamic cracking which is akin of thermal cracking, except that it happens at a much lower temperatures when high-velocity fluid jets collide with kinetic energies high enough to break carbon-carbon bonds. Then, we open the cooling loop, <clears throat> uh, feed valve and return valves, and pump the oil through the cooling loop via the feed pump action. By the time the oil cools to 40 degrees C, the pressure in the cooling loop goes down to zero PSIG, and as all of the volatile gases condense back into the liquid. At this point, we sample the oil via the sample valve. Anomalous results. We conduct the majority of our testing using Kendex 0842 atmospheric residue purchased uh, as um, a commodity from American Refining Group. This oil is very viscous. Uh, that in the latest batch and has an initial boiling point of 448 degrees C. This means that no vapor pressure is produced when the oil is heated to temperatures of under 448 degrees C. In other words, all of the volatile light distillers, such as gasoline, kerosene and diesel, were, were removed from this oil, leaving only very long chain hydrocarbons suitable for lubricant and asphalt production. In the past, we've spun our reactor at 50 Hz, 30, uh, 3000 RPM, and did not observe any anomalies. In recent tests, however, we have increased the reactor frequency to 60 Hz, 
3,600 RPM, and this is when we started noticing anomalous pressure buildup in the reactor as follows. When the reactor spins up, it develops head pressure due to the centrifugal action of the spinning rotor at 60 Hz. This pressure is 140 PSIG. As the oil temperature increases to 140 to 150 degrees C due to hydrodynamic turbulence and friction, we started developing rapid pressure increase. In a matter of seconds, the pressure exceeds 600 PSIG and pegs the pressure gauge. They don't know how high it's going because it's already hit the upper limit. If we do not react fast enough to turn off the motor, the runaway pressure would find its way out of the reactor causing a nasty oil leak. This is the same kind of failure mode, but in water, that is being observed by Bin Juen Huang when his system starts to produce excess heat and it's going above the kind of safe limits of the capability of the reactor to contain it, the pr pressure increase. We know that the pressure, with, sorry, we know that the pressure within the reactor must exceed 600 psig since the reactor was pressure tested and does not leak at pressures up to 400 psig. The leak has prompted us to rebuild the reactor by employing a new gasket and increasing the sealing surface between the stator and the uh, stator cover as well as installing the programmable pressure relief valve to bleed off the excess pressure into the cooling loop and thus limit the pressure within the reactor to some predetermined safe value. Initially, we thought that the buildup of pressure was due to formation of light hydrocarbons due to cracking, but this proved not to be the case. Mysteriously, as soon as one turns off the power, the reactor and the react uh, uh, to the reactor of the reactor, and the reactor spins down, the excessive pressure within the reactor, 600 psid, G, returns to zero. This happens in a matter of seconds, as if all the gas quickly reabsorbs back into the oil. When we start cycling oil through the cooling loop, the pressure in the cooling loop remains at zero psig until the oil temperature drops below 80 degrees C. During the cooling from 80 to 40 degrees C, profuse outgassing from the oil builds pressure in uh, the cooling loop to 30 to 50 psig. When we sampled the gas, we noted, noticed that it was heavier than air. We noted that it was heavier than air, had no smell or color, and was not combustible. Elemental analysis of the gas performed at a third-party lab, SGS, revealed that the gas was 90% nitrogen. 90% nitrogen. 9% O2, 0.5% CO2, and 0.5% trace amounts of hydrocarbons. Now, this is very interesting to me, because the gas that's most produced is nitrogen. And of course, nitrogen is the first in the CNO cycle that is beyond carbon. And so it would be the first thing you produce is nitrogen. And then if you happen to go a little bit further with nitrogen, you would end up producing some oxygen. Okay. This gas could have not uh, could not uh, be air. So this gas could could have not been air since one percent argon was not present, and the uh, and oxygen content was reduced. So yeah, they're saying it's not contaminant air. This is another g gas that was synthesized from this process. If oil had oxidized, uh, the lost oxygen volume would have been replaced with CO two and H two O. Yet there was only a trace amount of carbon dioxide and water was not even detected. A trace amount of carbon dioxide. Wow. Boom. Right there. You have the synthesis of all these gases and only a trace of CO2 coming from a hydrocarbon. Really? Coming from a hydrocarbon? We only have trace amounts Wow. This definitely is supporting the hypothesis that CO2, in the presence of extra hydrogen, which you obviously have, sorry, that the, the, uh, carbon and hydrogen can synthesize through to nitrogen and oxygen, preferentially to nitrogen. I'm really looking forward to the data coming back from the beam line. 
I'm asking for carbon-13 and carbon-14. Now, if we see either of those above the normal ratio of carbon, that would suggest that, sorry, if we see the ratio of carbon-13 over carbon-14 or car, uh, sorry, carbon-13 over carbon-12 or carbon-14 over carbon-12 above the normal ratio of um, those in the normal atmosphere or in normal soil or whatever, <clears throat> and I'm also looking for the ratio of nitrogen 15 over nitrogen 14. If any of those come back with anomalous values, it would suggest this stepwise synthesis of heavier isotopes of carbon and then pushing through to nitrogen and, and producing heavier isotopes of nitrogen and then oxygen and producing, uh, pushing through to up to oxygen 18. So in this first round of tests, which we hope to get the data back around the 11th of March, so put that in your calendars, I'll hope to have the data around that time. This will give us some indication of this, if it is likely that it is stepwise producing these isotopes. Uh, and then, then we'll do another test and look for the sulfur 34, which will give us indication on oxygen 17 and oxygen 18, which will obviously give us an indication on oxygen 18. But right here, when I'm reading this data, this is already giving very strong support that in a hydrocarbon system and in a cavitation system, which I believe we have demonstrated produces exactly the same magnetohydrodynamic structures, that allow for the ball lightning process, this coherent matter process. We are synthesizing in this system through cavitation, which is the same process, in my view, abundant nitrogen and oxygen. Abundant nitrogen and oxygen and very little CO2. Okay? If oil had oxidized, the lost oxygen volume would have been replaced with CO2 and H2O, yet there was only a trace amount of carbon dioxide and water was not even detected. It was not even detected. Very, very interesting. The sampled oil displayed very low viscosity and resembled soda pop due to the profuse bubbling, even when the oil was at ambient temperature. The bubbles appeared very small and evidently were responsible for the reduction in viscosity. When left overnight, the oil became so thick that it could not be poured from the cup and viscosity had increased to 2,400. <laughs> oh dear, that's not good at all. <laughs> Up from the original 1,400. But the density remained little changed. Elemental analysis, C, H, N and O, performed at the third-party lab revealed oxygen content increased from 0.2 to 0.4%, consistent with resin formation. Nitrogen content remained unchanged at 0.04% by mass level. This is very, very inter interesting. What they are saying here is that from the starting material to the pro end of the processed material, there was not a change in nitrogen content, right? So this large volume of gas, which was mostly nitrogen, was new nitrogen synthesized in the reactor. I don't, I keep saying to Malcolm, at some point my luck's going to run out. At some point my luck's going to run out. And maybe it's going to be on this beamline test. I mean, of course, they might not have enough material. They, they wanted almost they wanted more than I was going to give, I could give them. It was like very small amounts of milligram. But if this is true, if it really is producing uh, nitrogen, um, which this data would suggest, then um, it's, it's a really beautiful thing because we have potentially a solution to uh, pollution and it isn't dilution. It's actually transmutation of the carbon and the hydrogen into nitrogen. Okay. When left overnight in the reactor, the oil would continue outgassing and build uh, and build pressure. The highest output we have seen was 50 psig, 
16 hours after the test, the oil cooled to ambient temperature of about 20 degrees C. The summary. The summary of the anomalous results are as follows. Rapid outgassing with runaway pressure occurs when the reactor is running. Same as observed by Bin Jun Huang. When the reactor is stopped, the gas is quickly reabsorbed back into the liquid. The gas comes out of oil when the oil is cooled below 80 degrees C. The gas is 90% nitrogen, 9% oxygen, basically no carbon dioxide and hydrocarbons. Oxygen content in the oil is increased. So actually, what they're saying is, there is more oxygen synthesized, but it's actually changing the molecular structure of the oil. And so this actual oxygen production could actually be a fair chunk higher. Yeah? If it wasn't being absorbed by the oil and changing it into a resin. Resin. Resin content went up proportionally. So in, in the if the same kind of process is going on, and I'll have a gut feeling it might be in the in the thunderstorm generator, then uh, there actually may be more oxygen synthesized. Okay? And wouldn't it be interesting if the ratio was uh, 78% and 22% that literally this system actually produces atmospheric oxygen air. It would be utterly hilarious. Utterly hilarious. It would also draw into question how is our atmosphere actually made? The oil did not contain enough nitrogen. 0.03% Four percent by mass to account for nitrogen production based on the volume and pressure we produced 0.1 to 0.15 percent of nitrogen by mass <clears throat> are you with me <laughs> the new experiment because these results were deeply puzzling we decided to stage a new experiment conducted in the atmosphere of argon to rule out the potential contamination with atmospheric oxygen and nitrogen which is quite impossible since the air would have to creep into the pressure tested and airtight system and do so against a massive 600 psig of pressure originated from within the reactor yeah highly highly unlikely the new experiment set up as shown in figure three so they got a nitrogen sorry they got an argon container so there can't be any leaking in there okay the experiment set up with argon filled enclosure and the argon cylinder Still, we have built around the reactor plywood structure, plexiglass window, filled enclosure with argon fl uh, flowing from the gas cylinder. The argon gas flowed into the uh, um, into the chest and shaft seal for cooling and was discharged with, uh, within the enclosure, displacing the original air. Because the enclosure was not airtight, the flow of argon was continuous, 60 cubic foot per hour, to ensure that no backflow of air could occur. The enclosure was flushed with argon for 30 minutes prior to the experiment. The reactor loop was also flushed with argon prior to deposition of oil. To eliminate any remaining air in the system, we have applied heat and vacuum to the reactor loop. After we filled it with 6.2 litres of oil, we have initially topped off the tanklet of, uh, and the reactor and spun the rotor gently to ensure that we remove any large trapped air bubbles and added oil to maintain the level above the fill valve. Then we have heated the reactor with a propane torch to maintain the oil temperature at 70 to 80 degrees and mix gently by occasionally spinning the rotor. The 50 micron vacuum pump 19 was connected to the top of the fill valve to remove any gases. We degassed the oil in this manner for five hours. So they degassed the oil, then they put it into a argon chamber and had positive pressure on the argon with a flow. We have also degas the cooling loop by attaching the vacuum pump to the sampling valve and pulling 50 microns for 15 minutes uh, uh, before closing the sampling valve. Uh, thus, the cooling loop was under vacuum at the beginning of the test. So, uh, I'm not going to read through all of the experiment here, but essentially they did another experiment and you can see the pressure goes up a lot uh, when the uh, cooling loop dropped under 90 degrees. So similar story to the first time round. Um, thermal energy calculations, assuming the specific heat of oil, um, blah, 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 the mass of the steel reactor parts, blah, 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 did not reveal any anomalies as consumed electric power matched the observed heat production within 10% accuracy. So it could be the case 
that because of the neutrinos coming out of the device, uh, or because this happens in a coherent matter way, that the thunderstorm generator is around about not really producing much extra energy other than potentially clean, more cleanly burning the fuel, right? Which might give you, let's say, 15% more energy on a relatively efficient energy engine. But that's good in its own right. 15% is like finding 15% more reserves of oil in the world, right? But it is at least producing the same but potentially without a expensive catalytic converter and producing cleaner air and actually potentially close to breathable air. I still wouldn't recommend, based on what I saw, 100, up to 197 parts per million of carbon monoxide coming out. You know, you can handle the, the below 6% of CO2, but the, even the carbon monoxide at that level is not good. But what I'm saying is that's a lot better than 10, 20, 30,000, 3% carbon monoxide that typically comes out of those generators. And I imagine it can't be far off coming out of a tuk-tuk or a, uh, a motor rickshaw in, in, in Asia. Um, so if you could apply the technology to those device, those type of transportation devices, it would be absolutely transformational on uh, clean, cleaning up the air in uh, Asian cities and generally around the world. Um, so a, a great, beautiful thing. And it would also remove the absurd excuse uh, for uh, curtailing people's lives because of a little bit of carbon emission. Okay. So um, to continue the experiment, we have left the system closed and noted the pressure went to 50 PSIG by next morning. Same kind of observation. Um, we have bled the excess pressure to atmosphere and collected oil samples which had the characteristic of low viscosity and bubbly appearance. He actually said this is a bit like champagne or a soda pop when he was describing it to me. It said above as well. Then we have added 0.6 litres of fresh oil into the reactor to compensate for the oil loss due to sampling and, repeat, uh, and repeated the test. This time the test lasted for 1.5 minutes and we consumed uh, just under a kilowatt of energy as the oil heated from 49 to 240 degrees C. Once again, we have experienced a runaway pressure that triggered the pressure relief valve at 500 PSI. When we opened the cooling loop, we observed 10 PSI of pressure in the system. The reactor surface temperature was 110 uh, degrees C. We allowed the oil to cool to 58 uh, degrees C and observed only 2 PSI of pressure in the system. So, we repeated the experiment again by running the reactor 40 seconds. So, they do it several times, several times, blah, 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 blah. Right, experiment two. We have conducted the second test as follows. Flush the reactor, deposited the oil, evacuated the cooling loop, installed, installed the argon enclosure, started the reactor up to this new 60 hertz. Normal react, uh, state of pressure was 120 psi. Uh, when the oil in the reactor was 140 degrees C, the pressure started climbing to 500 and then the pressure relief valve came in. Uh, one minute into the test, we had to stop the reactor and replace the motor coupling, which was melted due to rubbing against the enclosure. That's not so good. <laughs> when we resumed the test, the oil already cooled down to 76 degrees. In about one minute, we reached 240 degrees C. Pressure relief valve was triggered again. Uh, blah, blah, blah. A total of just over two kilowatt hours of power was consumed. By the time the oil cooled to 50 degrees C, the pressure in the system dropped somewhat to 20 PSIG. Collected the processed oil sample, collected the gas in a swage lock cylinder and sent the samples along with the unprocessed Kendex to a third party lab, SGS in New Jersey, uh, for analysis. Released the remaining gas to the atmosphere and left the system closed overnight. The next day there were 10 PSIG of pressure in the system from the continued outgassing. Released the gas again, closed the valve, left overnight. The system developed 4 PSI the next day still. Results. Okay, so uh, the physical and chemical properties of the unprocessed and processed oil. So the raw stuff is this, and then the sample one, two, and three. So in the case of nitrogen here, uh, yeah, there's there's almost the same nitrogen in in the processed samples and the unprocessed samples. In the case of sulfur here, um, the the sample one. I think at the low low frequency was basically the same. Here it's saying not applicable, not applicable. Has the sulfur disappeared? If it has, that would be interesting. That's not the point of this conversation here, but it's interesting now that I'm seeing it um, for other things that uh, we're potentially discussing because we're going to be looking at sulfur as well. 
Um, hydrogen here appears to have gone down. That's interesting, isn't it? 13%, 13.1% here, 12.7%. That's a fair chunk, given the fact that the oil will have a lot of hydrogen in it. When it's dropped by that amount, that's, you know, of, of the hydrogen, that's quite a large percent, isn't it? Let's say we've got 13%. Uh, how many percent of the hydrogen in the oil has disappeared? 12.7 uh, divided by, let's say, 13 that's uh, 3%, 3, uh, 2.3% 2. Uh, 2 of the hydrogen has disappeared. Is that right? Something like that. That is quite a lot of hydrogen has disappeared. Um, carbon doesn't have disappeared that much, really. Um, it's kind of maintained its carbon. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, right. Gas composition. Nitrogen. 90% in the second series of tests, 86.55. Oxygen, 9, 12.5% there. Basically, very, very little carbon dioxide. Uh, the second test, they had a little bit more methane. Hydrogen, this one actually had some hydrogen in it. Very interesting. Uh, and very little, very little um, hydrocarbons in there. Hydrogen sulfide, there is that in the gas. Okay, so basically, a lot of nitrogen and even more oxygen in this case. This is very supportive of the thunderstorm generator. Very, very uh, supportive. Chemical composition, the raw Kendex saturates. Okay, so there is a change there. There is a change there. Okay, all right. I think this is the money shot, and I think it's also interesting to note that the change in hydrogen here over the start material and the fact that in this sample here, there was actually a little bit of hydrogen in the output gas. Not surprising if you're breaking up these molecules during the, during the extreme shear and cavitation that you will get some free hydrogen production. Um, but, you know... If you've got hydrogen coming off and it's atomic hydrogen, well, that's going to have this magnetic moment. It can be pulled into these magnetohydrodynamic structures, and that could be what uh, be you know happening. Temperature goes up. Okay, right. Discussion. The main question is where did the nitrogen and oxygen come from? Chemical analysis of oil samples indicate oxygen content increased by 0.2 to 0.4% in the processed oil sample compared to the unprocessed raw Kendex carbon content. And it remains unchanged to within 0.1%, but hydrogen content goes down 0.3%. Okay? 0.3%? Or is that 3%? What do we work it out as? Oh, I got rid of it. <clears throat> okay. The oxygen content grows with the degrees of processing. It is the largest in sample three. Yeah, so the longer you do it, the more oxygen you're getting. Why would that be? That would be because some of the synthesized nitrogen is be being synthesized through to oxygen. And it's a stepwise process. Nitrogen is being synthesized from the carbon. That's the first step in the journey. This is what I'm looking for in the, uh, one of the main things that I'm looking for in... The analysis on the beam line. This is my hypothesis. And it's just literally magical that through a complete si weird set of circumstances, I get shown this paper uh, by uh, Max just uh, over a week ago. Okay. In fact, after I had sent the samples off and, and had said this so hypothesis, it's very satisfying. I, ca I can't, my luck will run out at some point, but uh, uh, all right, this, so far it's going well. <laughs> so the longer you process it for, the more oxygen is synthesized. So let's say you had a much better um, thunderstorm generator, then you would end up with more oxygen and less nitrogen. Okay, And that would be coincident with, presumably, because it's stepwising in, and initiating from the carbon, it would be less carbon in the flue gases as well. Okay? All right.
The oxygen content grows with the degree of processing. It is the largest in sample three and is corroborated by the increase of uh, mass fraction of heavy asphaltic, uh, asphaltinic oxygen containing polar compounds. In other words, oxygen binds to oil creating resins. So it's not only that you're creating oxygen that is being seen in the gas, as we said earlier, it's at, some of that oxygen is as well being bound into the resins. And it could be the case that once the, the oil has been as absorbed as much oxygen it, oxygen as it can and become as much of a resin as it can you then have more oxygen synthesized which then cannot be captured let's say and you get a, a more abundant oxygen so heavy asphaltenic uh, polar compounds which result in the apparent viscosity increase after processing in other words this data is consistent with resinous oxidation of crude but does not answer the question of where does the oxygen come from also, the oxygen content seems to increase with the degree of processing while hydrogen content is decreasing. Converting these mass fractions into masses, we obtain 22.4 grams of new oxygen and 5.4 grams of new nitrogen that we cannot explain uh, easily explain. Okay, so there we go. So what they're saying is by looking at the resin formation, it's whilst the gas is, let's say, 90 or 86% uh, nitrogen or nine or or twelve percent oxygen, okay, depending on how long it's run for, because there's so much oxygen in the oil as it's converted to resins. There's actually more oxygen than nitrogen overall. Twenty two point four grams of new oxygen and five point six grams of new nitrogen. So this really suggests that there could be oxygen coming out of the thunderstorm generator if we assume that the cavitation process is the same as a plasma process in these magnetohydrodynamic structures. Then we can, uh, we, then we cannot easily, uh, that we cannot easily explain. And we have definitely lost 17 grams of hydrogen. Wow. So 17 grams of hydrogen, and some of that would be carbon capturing uh, uh, the hydrogen and producing oxygen and uh, nitrogen and of course hydrogen is not the heaviest uh, piece, uh, material um, so you know th this these are th as it says here these are huge quantities they are literally incredibly massive gas analysis reveals more or less con consistent nine to one nitrogen oxygen mixture with no traces of argon however there are traces of hydrogen Methane, ethylene, and other unsaturated light hydrocarbons that are associated with cracking products. Yet our process requires a process temperature of sorry, yet our process temperature of 140 to 150 degrees C was nowhere near the thermal cracking temperature required for these products to form. Well, it is interesting to note that if you look at some of the uh, maybe I haven't I don't know that some of the videos of the exhausts on the thunderstorm generator, even kind of out on the output from it are at least in this kind of ballpark whether that's important i don't know but it is important because the from the incoming water sense and flashing to steam because this is well over the boiling point of the incoming water that's entrained and in the water that's coming out of the bubbler and as uh, water vapor so entrained water droplets and water vapor this is well in excess of the boiling temperature okay now let's answer some frequently asked questions was the nitrogen dissolved in the oil? Nitrogen solubility in croid oil is 0.34% mole percent. Assuming the molar mass of that is, we obtain a total of this many moles of nitrogen in six, blah, blah, blah. This is 0.56 grams. Obviously, 0.56 grams is a hell of a lot less than 5.6 grams. Okay? It's, a, it's an order of magnitude less. This is a very small amount compared to 3.4 grams of nitrogen produced during the experiment. Um... Uh, besides the oil was degassed under 50 microns of vacuum for five hours uh, so the answer is no so basically it's not dissolved in the oil was there air trapped in pockets bubbles in the system the answer is clearly no since the system was degassed under a vacuum while heated and stirred all air pockets would have been removed also system was flushed with argon so any leftover gas would be would have been argon and not nitrogen did the nitrogen come from the oil the answer is once again no. Before and after the test, the oil contained 0.04% of nitrogen by mass, which is equivalent to 2 grams. 
Although on the same order of magnitude as the nitrogen produced, the processed oil did not exhibit any reduction in nitrogen content. Therefore, this could not have been a chemical outgassing. Could the air have been leaked from the outside? No. The system was airtight and pressure tested and under large internal pressure. This is what you do in a clean room in the, you know, semiconductors. You have positive pressure in there so dust can't come in. It, it just can be blown away from the, the entry ports. But most importantly, submersion in argon atmosphere would have resulted in contamination with argon, not air. And they didn't see the contamination with argon. Could the gas have come from the shaft seal coolant? No. The seal was flushed with argon during the tests. Could the gas have come from the gasket? No. We have tried different gasket materials, JB Weld and Teflon, with similar results. Could the gas have come from the steel? No. The amount of nitrogen is inconsistent with nitrogen solubility and stainless steel. Uh, we have run dozens of tests and every time there is nitrogen and oxygen production. If the commercial stainless steel were outgassing that much nitrogen at moderate temperatures, 100 to 200 degrees C, then the problem would have been manifested itself in every petrochemical process. Have we ruled out every possible source of contamination? Perhaps not. That is why we encourage independent analysis and criticism of the experiment presented in this report. Hypothesis. Theoretical Lena research seems to be focused on finding plausible explanation of how cold neutrons can be synthesized from hydrogen. Uh, because once you have neutrons, it is easy to explain fusion and transmutation since cold neutrons have very large cross-sections for absorption by almost any nucleus. Here are some of the popular theories. Mill's hydrino theory, a hypothesis is a fractional quantum number uh, states with energies below Bohr's ground state for hydrogen. This fractional quantum state of hydrogen basically represents a neutron. Mills has formed a company uh, to commercialize his hydrogen iron ideas. However, Mills says there is no transmutation in his process. Okay, so I would discount that. Centilli's hadronic theory offers an explanation akin to the point of view held by Rutherford that neutron is a bound state of a proton and an electron. Uh, this is like the SAM model. Um, in addition to fairly successful Magnagas Corporation, which trades on the NASDAQ, Santilli has formed a company called Thunder Fusion uh, at, to capitalize on his theory. He has recently published an experimental confirmation of the production of neutrons from arc discharge in hydrogen. Okay, when you have an arc discharge in hydrogen, then you are going to have the requisite conditions uh, for that kind of process to occur. Widom Larsen theory advocates the possibility of formation of ultra cold neutrons via the interaction of electrons with surface plasmons, whereby heavy electrons are formed and absorbed by protons locked uh, within the host metal's lattice. Currently, Widom Larsen theory is the number one candidate for explaining cold fusion in Lena phenomenon when this paper was published. Finally, I must mention that conventional textbook physics, which by way of the weak force, by way of the weak force, allows a proton to capture a neutrino and to transmute into a neutron. The proton plus plus a neutrino goes to a neutron and, and a, a positron. Okay? Uh, so this is, yeah, pro, uh, uh, that's the yeah, proton plus a neutrino goes to a neutron and, and an electron. Reaction was in fact observed in the infamous Nobel winning Cowens and Raines experiment. The only problem is the extreme low rate of reaction, which required large quantities of detector liquid in order to observe a handful of events. Okay. To this, these, I shall add my own hypothesis that goes like this. The theoretically possible yet highly improbable inverse beta decay reaction where a proton plus an electron goes to a new neutrin, uh, a neutron plus a, a neutrino, okay? Uh, it's actually an anti-neutrino you need on this, and that's the inverse, okay? So this is more like uh, um, uh, Alexander Parkamov becomes highly probable when the electron gains energy of 782 MeV, right? So... We solve this in the paper with Bin Zhuen Huang and thanks to Alexander Parkamov because you need this. This is the energy barrier I was talking about earlier. You need to overcome this in this theory put forward here by um, uh, Max Formachev Zamolov. And this is the same theory that was put forward by the independent 
uh, um, uh, peer that reviewed our paper, uh, Binger and Huang et al. The problem is you have this barrier to overcome and once you form the neutron and that goes into the receiver nucleus, you rem emit a gamma. And one might imagine that you're seeing these neutrons also emitted. As he said, he does not see neutrons and he does not see a gamma. Therefore, in my view, this cannot be the reaction. And uh, you have an insurmountable barrier. You, you don't have the uh, neutron and you don't have the gamma. But if in the paper of Binger and Huang, which I may see if I can pull up here. Um, let me see if I can find it. <laughs> yeah, somewhere here. <laughs> How is everyone? Are we there yet? We're nearly there yet. Uh huh. Go on. Must be somewhere here. Okay. Let me see if I can find it here. Mm hmm. Okay. So, uh. okay. So in our reaction here, you have the proton. Oh, maybe I can get it a little bit bigger. This is our reaction. Six. The proton and the electron and the antineutrino and the 16 oxygen, they all come together and based on the antineutrino, which is synthesized by the cavitation process. Okay, So the impact produce sufficient energy in the condensed matter to produce a neutrino and an antineutrino at ultra-low energies. The antineutrino here has a de Broglie wavelength. It's able to capture the nuclei of the proton and the nuclei of the oxygen and the electron. And effectively, this hydrogen and, and, and uh, an electron, this whole thing here is atomic hydrogen. These all come together. And the whole process here is net energy positive. It's net energy positive. So you don't have that 700 and something uh, uh, killer electron volt hurdle to overcome and because it occurs at the same time uh, you don't have the excitation of the nucleus and the release of uh, the gamma ray and so you just form the 17 oxygen okay this is effectively the same equation that he had okay where you have a neutron forming uh, and you emit the neutrino over here so here we go you have the neutron forming and you emit the neutrino. Okay, so this was the equation that was proposed by the reviewer, which is more absurd than ours. You know, you could argue ours is absurd. And as I say, later next week, I will talk about Parkamov's latest understanding where the neutrino, which is also uh, synthesized during the production of the neutrino and antineutrino, gets emitted at the uh, uh, really uh, taking away a lot of the energy. So you don't actually see mm, th what you would expect of the yield of energy from this process. Okay. So, um, and the reaction cross-section increases due to abnormally large local electron number density that uh, causes all local electron energy states to be coupled. Consequently, the surplus high energy electrons being fermions must have a Pauli exclusion principle and thus are forced to occupy the only available vacant states that reside within the nucleus. In other words, they are uh, that, uh, by overwhelming protons uh, uh, with electrons, we force some of them to combine. The trick is to create such conditions when the electrons cannot simply disperse 
like they would in a vacuum, but are highly confined in a quantum mechanical sense to a limited space with a limited number of energy levels and thus have nowhere to go except for the unoccupied high energy states within the nucleus. Perhaps such conditions were demonstrated as far back as 1922 in the controversial Irian and Went experiment where tungsten wire tungsten wire has been purportedly decomposed into alpha particles, helium gas, via a hard current explosion. These results have been reproduced by uh, Birikov and reported in 2000, uh, 2012 PhD dissertation. Proton-21 nucleus synthesis system arguably employs similar mechanisms where 99.99% pure 0.1 millimeter in diameter copper wire is impacted with a focused relativistic electron beam that forces the target implosion and synthesizes microscopic quantities of all sorts of elements releasing copious amounts of protons, deuterons and alpha particles. The best evidence yet comes from the recent publication Bugurovich et al., reporting the anomaly of high cold neutron flux registered during thunderstorms mm, during thunderstorms and lightning discharges. Mm. <laughs> it is an uncontestable experiment fa experimental fact published in a prestigious journal that was scrutinized under utmost rigor. The authors state that the detected levels of neutrons, syn neutron synthesis are three orders of magnitude higher than can be explained by the conventional photonuclear synthesis channel. It's not photosynthesis, photonuclear synthesis. Okay? Thus, there has to be some other hitherto unrecognized mechanism that makes cold neutron synthesis not only possible, but also highly probable during electric arcs. Boom! Another piece of evidence in favor of neutron synthesis during thunderstorms and lightning comes from NASA's Orbital Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope, which detected 511 keV gamma rays associated with terrestrial thunderstorms. When neutron synthesis happens, according to Cowan and Rain's mechanism, whereby proton transmutes into a neutron while emitting a positron, positrons travel up in the outer space, curving along the lines of the Earth's magnetic field until they collide with electrons and annihilate, emitting signature 511 keV gamma rays that are detected by Fermi. As such, I am forced to conclude that similar electric discharges must happen within the QVI hammer technology reactor, but perhaps on much smaller scale. For example, these discharges can occur in cores of collapsing cavitation bubbles generated by spinning rotor. Oil is an excellent dielectric and the rotor may be performing a function of a Van de Graaff generator. Charge separation, my friends. Separating charges. Separating charges by friction. The discharges in oil must generate cold neutrons. Likely, luckily, there is plenty of hydrogen. The neutrons interact with carbon and nitrogen atoms, producing nitrogen and oxygen. The massive energy that is released in the process must be entirely absorbed by the metal parts of the reactor, which I predict must contain evidence of nuclear transmutation. Alternatively, the surface of the machine may be covered with metastable nuclear clusters that act as um, miniature nuclear batteries, storing immense energy that is released when the nuclear clusters are decomposed via energetic ionic or electron beams or via high power laser irradiation. According to Adamenko, such phenomena was observed on numerous occasions when exposed to proton-21 targets were scanned with high energy scanning electron microscope uh, electron or ionic beams re uh, releasing massive amounts of energy in the form of charged predominantly alpha particles. Perhaps it is time to re-examine Rutherford's idea that neutron is a bound state of a proton and an electron and develop the idea further to achieve a consistent representation of a nucleus as a lattice of photon, uh, protons that are glued together by rapidly moving electrons that navigate the maze of the positive charges and hold them together, perhaps magnetically, against the Coulomb repulsion creating an intricate perpetual oscillation of proton-neutron states where proton and neutron identities are smeared. The SAM guys would be very happy to hear that. Conclusion. When you have eliminated the impossible, i.e. physical and chemical processes, whatever remains nuclear processes, however improbable, must be the truth. 
Thus, we are forced to conclude that the production of oxygen and nitrogen in our experiment must be Lenner in nature. We are lucky to have had stumbled upon a phenomenon that is easy to reproduce. Our setup is not suffering from the reproducibility issues that plague the Lenner community. Therefore, we are, have reasons to believe that this simple experiment will be the smoking gun that will catapult Lenner into the mainstream. Future analysis it will be helpful to conduct isotopic analysis of the generated gas and of the reactor surface in order to build a better case for Lena. Perhaps one would observe unnatural isotopic ratios in the evidence of the elemental transmutation, both in the gas and on the surface of the metal. And that is currently what I am doing with the sample that we scraped from the inside of the 24-inch sphere from the thunderstorm generator. We have also observed anomalous isotopic oxygen production, it would appear, in the reactor of Bin Juen Huang. So there we go. That is that, my friends. Do you have any questions? Uh, for me, uh, this is extremely good evidence coming from two different parties. Alexander Shishkin on the synthesis of deuterons, which requires possibly uh, the production of uh, neutrons and also the production of oxygen 18 uh, which is stepwise and this very stepwise that we proposed a number of times and it it looks like it's happening in the um, Bin Juen Huang work and it looks like uh, it is happening in the thunderstorm generator and if so these are frankly totally totally revolutionary technologies Okay, so you're saying that the 37 litres was 14 kilowatts. Well, right. Okay, because he only had it running... Right, so in 11 minutes... Is that kilo, kilowatt hours? Um, because he, he it's only a 8.5 kilowatt motor, isn't it? And it was running for 11 minutes, so... Thank you for doing that, Mass. That is uh, interesting, isn't it? Hi, Kim. <laughs> Love you. Okay, so... So Stephen B. Hall say the rapid rise in pressure is when electrons are unable to stack like donuts because they must flip orientations too fast, which takes up more space. Interesting theory, Stephen. Uh, have you got some supporting uh, data or papers on that? It'd be very interesting. Yeah, it is. A, it, this device that is used in this paper that I'm discussing here, uh, not this one, uh, this one by Max formichev Zamilov. Uh, used a water hammer type reactor uh, in extreme hydrodynamic shear situation. Uh, this one here. Tammy, it's okay to be late. Better late than never, my dad always used to say. So Elva Loho says, if, if 20 years from now science fully understands Lena, I wonder if we will uh, look at ancient alchemy and its search for transmutation into gold with a different attitude. Um... I hope so, and I hope it's not going to be 20 years. <laughs> I hope with the, the technologies that we're currently trying to um, take into a, a sellable product, um, or rather the project is trying to assist third parties to uh, take towards uh, being sellable products, um, it's going to be absolutely incontrovertible in short order. So Curtis Swan says, Bob, what physics theories predict that neutrons are a composite? I've been working on one of them. Are there others? Yeah, there's the um, something atomic model, SAM model. You can go and look it up. There's a good website. 
Um, um, yeah, uh, and there's one mentioned in this uh, uh, paper. Yeah, because everyone, the first people, uh, sorry, the first question that people ask when you say, oh, transmutation, they say, oh, can you make gold? And so I dealt with that with the first iteration of the Parkamov reaction tables. And I found, using 50 seconds of my time, that the elements um, bismuth, lead, and mercury are most favorably producing the most synthesis of gold when they're using potassium and calcium and these are what was originally uh, used by the alchemists and so um, what they were doing for thousands of years is the thing that's most likely to produce gold it doesn't produce all gold because it's a statistical thing but it's about producing a proportion of um, and it's probably some temperature resonance and, and so forth So uh, where can I find instructions for a generator to make energy? All right, so we already have two people that have expressed an interest in uh, producing um, uh, models for the Cladoff cavitator. Um, and uh, one is someone that works in SolidWorks, another one that's work, ones that work, one that works in Rhino. If there's more people that are interested in coming together on that, then let me know. Uh, obviously, those models, if they are made, they will be shared and made public, and so um, you can expect to see those. They will probably be in such a way that it will be easy to make them via CNC. I probably will ask if we can get... We could probably come up with something similar to the um, slot system. I think I think Shishkin would be happy to share his design. But bearing in mind, it produced a lethal dose of radiation in his point of view in about uh, one hour. So, you know, th this is deep proceed with caution. You know, we're, we are simultaneously working on trying to establish a decent method of produ producing the etheric matter or uh, birdies or whatever. And this system would probably do that as well. And then shielding for that. So you, you need to have distance uh, and, and play safe, particularly if you're doing things like like was suggested by Cladoff, adding lithium chloride, and particularly if you're doing things like I suggested, adding uh, tungsten powder. Uh, great, Darren. The, the, the point about the project in its second phase is about trying to teach well trying to understand the process and then uh, the third phase is all about teaching and enabling production of, of uh, technology that has utility uh elva loho says can lena be weaponized how bad can it get compared to thermonuclear weapons um i think the process behind lena has already been weaponized i think it was first weaponized probably in the 1950s i've said this many times um uh and arguably the magneto I, I i will give a video that um was said by a person and I, conclusively in my view it states that it, it is known how to trigger earthquakes with the magneto hydrodynamic dynamic pulses um and so yeah <laughs> Basically, because you're hacking about hacking the way nature actually makes and destroys matter, you can do everything in between. Um, and so uh, it is the great power, uh, as I've said many times. Um, it's the God's toolbox and it needs to be treated accordingly. Um, So I'm going to look up for your questions.
I think um, this particular work by uh, Max Formichev Zamolov really, really supports the idea uh, that the that the thunderstorm generator could be producing nitrogen first and then oxygen. And I think potentially within the coming weeks and months, uh, we might have these independent party analysis um, that might might support that with firm, firm data. So, uh, like I say, my luck's got to run out at some point, but having staked my claim that that may be what's going on and that's why you're not potentially seeing it because it's, it's actually producing more nitrogen and that's not being detected in the gases... Um, I I think uh, this is just a, a gift. <laughs> it's a gift, and it it almost makes me more nervous to see what the data is that comes out of the beam line. Uh, it would be disappointing if they decide they don't actually have enough material, because then we'll have to do it all again, and there'll be this nail biting delay again. So D2105K, does it help that the tungsten can handle high enough temperatures to produce some extra cold neutrons, neutrinos rather? Uh, yes, it does, actually. Um, so, yeah. That's actually, you know, I had these discussions with Parkamov a number of years back and he actually did the experiments with tungsten filament light bulbs overdriven to where the... 50% of the density of the uh, oh, sorry 50% of the matter in the tungsten filament uh, light bulb uh would be producing uh relic neutrino level cold neutrinos and he then had secondary materials so you go and look at some of Parkamov's presentations on the MFMP website and you can see that he found that lithium fluoride lithium fluoride as a secondary target material uh produced some of the highest um uh, output of um, uh, extra thermal energy. Now, if you can imagine, the lithium maybe, um, yeah. Anyway, so lithium fluoride and maybe potassium compounds in there as well. So uh, Lithnik says, if you add a higher a second TSG to the output of TSG, would you get a higher concentration of oxygen? There's only one way to find out, but we, these things are things that come much later in the research. The the, the current TSG is, is essentially an early stage prototype, but it already appears uh, to be doing most of what you want it to do. I do know that in the GEET, Paul Pantone would take a small GEET and he would run that into a bigger GEET. So this kind of concept has already been thought about before. Um, it's the natural progression. Uh, but I, I think it's important that you're what you're doing is you're providing to the thunderstorm generator another source of hydrogen. And it is the hydrogen that is doing the work, it would appear, of uh, doing this transmutation of the carbon into um, nitrogen and then oxygen, in my view, and in... Uh, in review of this paper it supports my view and let's hope the data uh, uh <laughs> do, do, doesn't uh, break my winning streak <laughs> <laughs> so overwound games has said has anyone stuck a radiation neutron detector next to a food blender smoothie maker might have a new marketing idea for neutron points <laughs> mm, i'm not sure that's going to be a good one for them <laughs>
Okay, I'm going to come down to the bottom. We'll do a quick review. And then I might call it an early night for me. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be pleased. Uh, Uh, Nick Knock, if there's any extra gas produced, um, then one can imagine higher pressures, so that does more work, yes. Uh, if some of the energy is actually released, that again would lead to more pressures and so forth. So th there are different ways the energy balance can come out, but if you want to understand how important it is to deal with the pollution problem you have to go to India. India is the world's most populous nation now. It announced in December it was going to double its coal use. And <clears throat> in the last week, it is announced, has announced that it's going to triple, yes, I say triple its gas use. Okay, so now more than ever, we need to find a solution to the pollution. And it isn't going to be dilution. It needs to be potentially this technology of the thunderstorm generator. <clears throat> so uh, Elliot about he's asking about torsion fields. I think the the ma the magnetohydrodynamic structure, the complex current structures that produce these fractal torus current structures. The the um I think it is the fractal toroidal moment that is creating these torsion fields that that leads to these vortexes i was also sent a very very interesting book uh, two books in fact but one is an update of the previous book by shishkin when i asked him to send me the patent or a link to a patent from kladov and in this book it's all in Russian, but it's I'm gonna need it's gonna need a lot of work to translate. But even just skimming through it, it pointed out something that I intuitively had known that I'd discussed many times, but to see it absolutely written down as a certainty, it's this. There are literally only two things that can produce negentropy, and that is a tornado and a ring soliton. That's it. In the universe, those are the only two options. For producing neg, neg, neg entropy, i.e., that is pushing things together uh, in order to organize them. And what we have seen is that a wheel within a wheel within a wheel, with at least two at uh, the top fractal level, that actually produces a tornado. <laughs> so, you know, the tornado is an emergent thing out of the ring soliton. And so one could argue that the ring soliton is the fundamental structure that drives all neg entropy in the universe. We are facing more, I think, a element a technological element crisis than we are an environmental crisis or an energy crisis or a pollution crisis i think the pollution crisis can be fixed by this technology i think the energy crisis can be we've still got lots of things to use for energy uh, we just need to be allowed to use them and if we can fix that uh, use them cleanly they're using this technology then that solves that problem and for me later down the line it's using this technology to synthesize technological elements by having the cookbook to specifically target particular elements with a reasonable yield brandon bulton you and me both he wants to fill up his truck with water Slowly, slowly catch the monkey. So Free Life Taz says, Bob, did you see the first presenter on APEC yesterday? Very interesting. I didn't. You're the second person person that has uh, referred me to that. 
um, I kind of have a family day on a Saturday and I kind of prepare for my presentation on a Sunday uh, so I can get it out to you guys, something of interest in the plethora of the things that I have mounted up to, to get get out to you guys. Um, and and so I hadn't had a chance to either engage with it or, or uh, uh, review it uh, yet, but I will do. Thank you for noting that. So Curtis Horn says, Bob, we really need to talk about the Quartonian Unia forward fired theories, physics theory I'm working on Sunday. Much of what you're saying comes out of that theory naturally. Well, fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I said a long time ago, I, I, for me to be able to educate and, and to share in a way that anyone can understand, whatever it is, it needs to be natural and simple and it, it needs to be able to be uh, easy to connect with and visceral and 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 real and tangible and for me it has to be something that's easy to replicate and see on physically macro scale levels and we got lucky I think I think that is what it is and it is scale invariant although it, it appears to be quantized um, uh, but if there is underlying maths uh, that that could describe that beyond what has already been shared and the works of um, Afanasyev and and Dubovic and 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 so forth, describing these complex current structures and their non-radiating boundaries and 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 why they don't radiate electromagnetic waves and the scale and vector potential and the way they cluster and the way they interact. If there's something that's below that, then that would be great. Um, anything that leads to more predictive capability and more precise knowledge of what an outcome will be given a certain set of circumstances. But I think there is a lot of low-hanging fruit and uh, I think that this is a big billboard allowing us to see the wood in the forest the wood for the trees this is this is supporting the hypothesis that these uh negentropy structures uh that can organize and condense matter further these solitons and the tornadoes that are emergent from the solitons from their phase singularity that these structures can reorganize matter and that if we use them judiciously and appropriately and focus on the positive things that can be done with them, then we can deal with some of the most intractable and most talked about problems that humanity is facing. Yeah, so Gordon's talking about cyclones and anticyclones. Yes, of course, there are cyclones and anticyclones in um, uh, these... Uh, uh, yin yang type structures and and actually that was talked about uh, also within uh the russian community presentation recently <laughs> alva loho bob have you considered moving the camera slightly further away right now it feels like i on an intimate date with you <laughs> uh this is how i roll uh um you know i uh, i I, I believe that the window is the soul to the, uh, you know, is the uh, window to the soul. And uh, I want you to know that I really believe in what I'm, uh, I'm saying. I'm, I'm, uh, I might be wrong sometimes, <laughs> and I might have believed something that was wrong, but I genuinely believe what I'm saying. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I look at people's faces and I can see whether they're, you know, hiding truth, uh, they are manipulating the truth, they are um, uh, maybe uh, just straight out lying, <laughs> or that they actually don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> and they're blagging it. All of these things you can see in the face, and part about, part about my, part of what I'm trying to do is to when I'm delivering things is to know that when when I'm annoyed about something 
the the listener knows that 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 is not feigned annoyance that is genuine genuine feeling um and when i'm saying something i believe is true um that you can feel that it is what i'm saying and so i'm i'm sorry but like <laughs> i have enough problems can, g- keeping my system here running smoothly anyway so <laughs> it's it's a logistics thing I, i'd have to buy a new support or whatever and and and, and it would look weird so there we go <laughs> So um, I'm afraid that that's that's what I've got. So, Elliot, the UAE has trillions of reasons to destroy and suppress anything that accelerates the transition to, uh, or rather, from fossil fuel. Well, here's the thing. Fossil fuel probably is a misnomer, other than for, say, coal, where you can literally find bits of wood in it. Um, Because we find these systems appear to produce carbon a lot of the time and hydrogen, then one from almost whatever you put in there then hydrocarbons could be synthesized by the earth in magnetohydrodynamic structures in the depths it could be a long-term renewable resource but if you argue that there is a problematic greenhouse effect from uh, rapid uh, emissions of that resource into the atmosphere then it would appear that the thunderstorm generator, if it is doing what appears to be happening in this paper, as I hypothesize also um, prior to reading this paper, <laughs> then um, then we've solved that. And the biggest friend in the world of the thunderstorm generator is the entire petrochemical industry. Uh, it's It's huge. And it also allows us to burn things like methane hydrates and stuff which are far more damaging to the environment than uh, all of the other types of hydrocarbons that are commonly used and uh, uh, would give us another 300 years of the current energy use but without the negative sides that are claimed for it. So the question is what year is this paper? Well we can actually go, let me let me just look that up. If you it's actually on ResearchGate, so you can go and download it before I even put the the thing up there. So I can go here. I'm going to just kind of copy the uh, title. And we'll go into Safari, new tab. And I'll go here. And here we go. So it is from October 2014. So nine years ago. Nine years ago, my friends nine years ago of course at this time nasa was talking about uh the widom larsen theory of course they've moved on to something that's even further away from seeing things in plasma and cavitation they've gone to this new moniker called lattice assisted nuclear reactions lana or or what is it um yeah something like that uh, but since we see these in, things in water, in the free volume of water, in cavitation, and since we see these things in plasma, I I think that's a way of avoiding us getting into some of these more interesting technologies. Personally, that's my feeling. Um, so there we go. So Harry said, Bob, I'm not sure if you missed it, but did you find an answer regarding the safety of the TSG with its potential strange radiation because the tsg is not producing in my view very specifically resonant locations it may not be producing high fluxes of this um cavitation 
is very, very intense. As you see within, I, I don't know, I, I think you, one needs to focus on the fact that it might be. Then we need to find out whether some forms of emissions are dangerous to human life and some are not. It might be that the flux that comes out of this particular device is actually beneficial. Um, but this is, again, it's a prototype and that's where much more study needs to be done. Of course, no one is living inside a nuclear reactor and pretty much a good proportion, if not uh, the majority of electricity, for instance, in France is generated in nuclear reactors. These devices, if you, for instance, had a large generator, a one megawatt generator running on natural gas or on refuse gas, and it was producing no CO2, then you wouldn't be hanging around by that refuse gas electricity generating uh, generator, would you? So you would be producing clean and really, really clean uh, energy without or limiting CO2 and CO emissions. And you would be preventing the release of the methane from that waste site into the atmosphere where it is over a 100 year period, 29 times more damaging or so. Uh, I think that's methane hydrates. But anyway, it much more damaging than CO2, according to climate climatists or what do they call them? Climate climate people who go on about the climate. Yeah, so a Z pinch is essentially a tornado. So this book talks about how uh, a tornado um, and a ring soliton are the only two sort of negative entropy structures that exist in nature. And in fact, kind of, a, a ring soliton is almost like a, <clears throat> it's a tornado that's linked in on itself. Yeah, yeah, Harry, as much as I'd like uh, an answer to everything immediately, it takes a lot of hard work and actually doing. It's why your guys' support is so important. Uh, it's why real experimental, uh, experimentalists should be nurtured and cherished. There is not many. <laughs> and and also, it's important to share people's data. Um, and also, work. You know, you can all do this. You can all go out into the archives of research and read actually read not just the abstract but read through a paper like i did today and see if there's anything in there that was just an anomaly a kind of piece of serendipity that happened to be noticed that could point to uh understanding better what is going on with nature in these environments and these technologies you can do it and you know how many views has this had this has had 1165 reads since october 2014 so in the best part of nine and a bit years it's had 1165 reads it is reasonable to expect that within a week and a half's time this paper will have been known about by double this just from this video and that's because of you guys you guys sharing this data sharing this presentation we will be able to triple the number of eyes on max formachev zamilov's publication in 2014 so this work was probably done 10 years ago right we will be able to triple the exposure but in context of what's going on with the cavitation work of binger and huang and in context of the work of the which is magne magnetohydrodynamic in my view and what is going on with the thunderstorm generator of malcolm bendel um this provides some of the strongest uh, uh, evidence for the direction in which i believe the evidence is pointing corky it's difficult to share when 
it's so much uh, difference between your understanding and your knowledge on the situation and the third party. Sometimes it's just saying uh, what this will enable and what what benefit because people they really don't care most of the time about anything other than eating the other end, sleeping and having some good time with their friends and being able to pay their bills and and and, those, and where they're going on holiday. Uh, but, you know, it, it would be great if when the next go to India, it's really nice clean air and everyone's happy and they're not choking and so on. Or, you know, other places open up for visiting because they're now nice to visit. <laughs> um, it would be nice that humans aren't limited to live within 15 miles of their house or 15 kilometers of their house or 15 minutes drive from their house and, and a couple of flights in their lifetime because of the panic about CO2 being released into the atmosphere. It would be nice if that was taken off the table. Take it off the table. <laughs> Thank you. Done. <laughs> And uh, I think, you know, there is a reasonable chance uh, we might be moving in that direction. It would be, it's, it's still almost beyond belief, even for me. Um, but this kind of evidence here is pointing in the same direction. And it's not like I went back in time and told Max Formichev Zamilov to, <laughs> to do this research and find this data from an independent testing party. And it really is an independent testing party. They sent off the gas to whatever it was, SDS, uh, wherever it was. Okay, I think I'm gonna. I'll answer your questions. If you have any more questions, please put them in the blog. Um, this was ultra stepwise, and during this presentation, we talked about the work of Alexander Shishkin in his cavitator where in his work he observed in 37 liters of water processed for 11 minutes and 45 seconds using an 8.5 kilowatt motor a temperature rise of 60 degrees maximally he had to shut it down at that because it started to produce steam and therefore it wouldn't work and he saw the synthesis of not Totally conclusive extra deuterium, but good evidence for the production of oxygen 18, which is effectively deuterium going into oxygen 16. And so there's double support there for the synthesis of deuterium, but also there is support for the synthesis of neutrons uh, locally to both a proton and to an oxygen nucleus. And this tells a story where hydrogen H2 of H2O can end up going into O and forming O18, with one of them becoming a neutron. In fact, both of them becoming a neutron in this case. And that if you are synthesizing deuterium onto to carbon, then that could make a nitrogen nuclei. And if you put a deuterium into nitrogen uh, you could make a oxygen nuclei and then we looked at another paper by Max Formichev Zamilov and he observed in a reasonably similar si uh, system but processing oil the production of nitrogen and oxygen I would argue pretty darn conclusive and this is pointing into a direction that supports collectively both the observations of Binger and Huang et al and of 
uh, the thunderstorm gen generator uh, of Malcolm Bendel. Respectively, one is a cavitation system, which we have proven produces the iron-rich crenellated ball signatures of ball lightning, and a plasma system, which we have proved in uh, Hank Urian's experiment, produce the iron-rich crenellated microspheres signature of ball lightning. And that uh, his equation here that he proposes at this stage in 2014, this bearing in mind this is all before the published works of uh, Alexander Parkhamov and the, our reaction table, he proposes a reaction which was equivalent to reaction 7 that was proposed by the reviewer, one of the reviewers in the peer review of um, scientific reports, nature scientific reports, as an alternative to our proposal, except in this proposal you have an energy barrier to overcome and you would synthesize uh, a neutron which may escape but we don't observe that or it, or rather it wasn't observed by Max Formichev Zamolov and because it would excite the nucleus you would then see a gamma we don't see the gamma and neither did Max uh, Formichev Zamolov and so I'm tending to think it's this and we will do an update on that and so it's very very supportive of this overall understanding and the levels of gas production in this short run um, here are really rather huge and uh, so thank you very much to Alexander Shishkin and thank you very much to Max Formichev Zamolov and I will say thank you to everyone for your great conversation here uh, oh, sorry. Ma Ma great to have you here, Alan Goldwater. Magic Sound has joined us. Hi, Bobby. Max is table three. Are the percentages by mass or by atomic ratio? That is true. Uh, that is true. It is a big difference. Um, I think he pretty much would have got the right one. Um, uh, it is a good question to ask him. But I, I think the, the conclusion is essentially this is percent by mole right so that's by molar gas percent um, and SGS yeah so this is the gas composition by SGS so it says by mole so you're saying in table three table three uh, we'll take mm, table three is to do with the um, yeah, right. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not so much, much focused on table three, unless you're referring to table three being this one. But I think this is table one. This is table two. So are you referring to table two or table three? I think these things can be cleared up. Yeah, okay. Table table two. It says mole, gas moles, I guess. Um. So th this is looking at the gas and the volume of gas in there of molar ratio, I guess. So if you've got one mole, 90% uh, of that mole is, is nitrogen and nine, <laughs> right? Anyway, I, th I think the conclusion is they, they, they did the mass analysis down here and they found that, um, where was it? Uh they did the actual weight of the ga of of the atoms produced, so I, I I'm pretty sure that Max would have got that right. Yeah, he's saying here that nitrogen soluble. No, where is it? Uh, the gas production is ni nine to one nitrogen to oxygen, but the weight, because some of the nitrogen gets trapped in the oil, it says here twenty two point four grams of new oxygen and five point six grams of new nitrogen, and there is seventeen grams of missing hydrogen uh yeah well no no i think most of the important uh, mass uh, uh, analysis is here converting these mass fractions into masses 
we attain 22.4 grams of new oxygen, 5.6 grams of new nitrogen that we cannot easily explain, right? So the other stuff that they can explain, they've probably taken out that. And we have definitely lost uh, 17 grams of hydrogen. These are huge quantities, and I conclude and agree with that. Yeah. So that is grams of hydrogen, not molar gas volumes. Okay. So I think that that settles, I think, your question there. All right. So uh, I'll, I'll try my outro again. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, for joining us. Um, so uh, this was Ultra Stepwise, 18th of February, 2024. And in this presentation, using the recently an, uh, revealed work of Alexander Shishkin, post the paper of Binjun Huang et al., there were step stepwise synthesize of protons to deuterons and would appear to be production of heavy oxygen. And in the work of Max Formachev Zamilov, so that was from 2018, and from 2014, uh, Max Formachev Zamilov saw the production of nitrogen and oxygen. Apparently, it would seem from carbon and a loss of hydrogen very strongly pointing in the direction that would support both the work of Binjun Huang et al. and uh, uh, Malcolm Bendel, respectively, in ultrasonic water cavitation heat generator and the thunderstorm generator. So with that, I will say thank you very much, and I will see you in the next video. When is notches? Dobronots. Good night.